The 2023 Lincoln Corsair next to me proves that Lincoln can build a better Lexus than Lexus. That's not an insult, and it's something that I think more luxury shoppers should know about. According to conventional wisdom and, of course, the enthusiast community, if you want to design a real luxury SUV, it needs to be rear-wheel drive. But, of course, the Lexus NX and RX are the best sellers in this segment, and they start as front-wheel drive vehicles, just like the Lincoln Corsair here. Of course, if you want a rear-wheel drive Lincoln SUV, that would be the Aviator. It's the three-row model in the lineup, and it has decidedly different driving dynamics to this. But a lot of luxury shoppers are interested in something that focuses on comfort and efficiency, and that is certainly what's going on with especially this Corsair, because this is the plug-in hybrid model. For 2023, the Corsair has received a bit of a refresh. We get LED headlights that are jewel styled in the top trims. They're gonna be a little bit different in the lower end models, but they're still full LEDs. And then we get this absolutely massive Lincoln grille up front. It has certainly grown, and it's a little bit angrier with this sort of curve in down there at the bottom. Each of these little design elements in the grill mimics the Lincoln logo right there in the center. So if you're wondering what's going on there, that's how it works. Down here we have the turn signal, no fog lights or anything like that at the bottom, just parking sensors and another chrome strip to help frame the grill. Design-wise, I think the Volvo and the Acura are a little bit more attractive in this particular segment, but this is certainly more appealing to my eye than what we find in the NX and the RX. With an overall length of 181.4 inches, the Corsair is on the short side of the Alphabet Soup compact luxury SUV segment that includes the Lexus NX, the Acura RDX, BMW X3, Mercedes-Benz GLC, Volvo XC60, Infiniti QX50, and QX55, the Alfa Romeo Stelvio, and a number of other options that I would trip over my tongue if I attempted to spit them out now. But on the smaller side of the segment on the outside does not mean smaller side of the segment on the inside especially when you take a look at some of the rear wheel drive options. And that is certainly the advantage for the front wheel drive packaging that we find in the Corsair. You do find a little bit more room in the Acura RDX in the real world, but the difference is not enormous, even though the RDX is about five inches longer. So this is certainly gonna be a little easier to park. I think the Corsair has a presence that belies some of its dimensions. Part of that is because we have a really wide LED taillight set up here. It spans completely from one side of the vehicle to the other because it opens with the hatch, very similar to what we find in some Audi models for a very similar stylistic reason. You'll notice that the taillight modules, because they move when the hatch opens, have to be repeated down here at the bottom of the bumper. This is again, very similar to what we find in modern Audi designs. It does mean that the opening of the cargo area is a little bit smaller than it would otherwise appear because of course, the hatch is so broad and so wide, but as you can see, it really does give this this accentuated width look. We then have a greenhouse that pinches in a little bit towards the top to help give it more of a athletic hip style shape. LED turn signals that are amber, that's something that I really do appreciate, and even this plug-in hybrid model gets twin exhaust tips down at the bottom of the bumper. Although this black plastic section down here is shiny and it is a little tricky to clean, it also is probably gonna sew scratches a little bit easier than the body colored bumper above. For 2023, Lincoln has decided to delete the optional 2.3 liter turbo, leaving you the choice of better performance or better fuel economy and EV range. The standard two liter turbo is gonna be the fastest zero to 60, 6.1 seconds approximately, thanks to 250 horsepower, 275 pound-feet of torque. That's mated to an eight-speed automatic transmission and your choice of front-wheel drive or all-wheel drive. You'll get 24 to 25 miles per gallon depending on the options you choose. If you want 33 miles per gallon and 28 miles of EV range, then you want this plug-in hybrid system. I should note, however, that the 33 MPG combined score is an estimate because the EPA official numbers have not been released yet. This plug-in hybrid system gives you 266 horsepower combined thanks to the 2.5 liter four-cylinder engine on this side of the engine bay and two electric motors and a planetary power split system over here on this side. This does not use a transmission in the traditional sense. It's a single planetary gear set, two electric motors and the engine, everything together functions like a transmission, like a CVT, which is why some companies call it an eCVT. The benefit to this drivetrain design is that it works really well as a hybrid for high fuel economy, and to get a plug-in hybrid, you just add a bigger battery pack to the rear because the electric motors are already quite sizable. That battery pack in the rear is 14.4 kilowatt hours, so this is a relatively efficient plug-in hybrid system even though it has a mechanical all-wheel drive setup. So no separate e-motor in the back, just two motors up front and the engine right there. 
Both drivetrains are rated to tow 3,000 pounds when properly equipped. Lincoln locates the charge port just in front of the driver's door. There's an onboard 3.7 kilowatt charger that will get this battery from empty to completely full in three and a half hours. And Lincoln includes a level two 240 volt EVSE with the vehicle as well. One of the benefits, however, to a plug-in hybrid system like this with a smaller battery and higher efficiency is that you can also charge this battery in about 10 hours at 120 volts. So if you just have a regular 120 volt outlet in your garage, most folks should be able to get a complete charge overnight. If this system sounds very familiar, if it sounds very much like the Lexus NX450H Plus, then you're right. But there are a few key differences. The NX450H Plus is a little bit more focused on performance. You'll get 304 horsepower out of that system. It has a bigger battery pack, 18.1 kilowatt hours, so it's gonna take a little bit longer to charge, and you'll get a little bit more electric range, about 37 miles out of that system. It's also $5,500 more expensive, however, than this. I think the Corsair is just a nicer vehicle inside and outside. Obviously, though, if you want the extra range and if you want the extra power, you're gonna want the Lexus. Another key difference though, this has a mechanical all-wheel drive system and the Lexus NX uses an E all-wheel drive system. So there's a third electric motor on the rear axle and it cannot send as much oomph to the back axle if the front wheels are slipping as this system can. So if you're looking for something that feels very traditional and very sure-footed on snow and ice, the Lincoln is definitely gonna have an advantage there. It's not that the NX is incapable in those situations. It just is not gonna feel like this. The lack of a mechanical all-wheel drive system in that Lexus hybrid system means you really have to spin the front wheels up. So they're really doing a lot of spinning on snow and ice before more power can get sent to the rear. The Corsair we're looking at today has an MSRP of nearly $66,000. So logically, these front seats are among the most comfortable in the segment. I would say these are nearly the equal of the XC60's front seats in its top end trim, and that's definitely saying something. This has the optional 24-way perfect position Lincoln seats. That's quite a mouthful. It has a thigh cushion extension system that's somewhat unique. You can extend the left or the right portion of that thigh bolster independently of one another. I think it's a little bit silly. I have never sat in a seat and thought, really, I wish one side was shorter than the other. Maybe it's because my legs are the same length. But if you do like sitting in sort of this position where you have one leg up and then one leg extended at the pedals, then maybe this is gonna be a bit more comfortable than one of those solitary uh, thigh extension cushions. At any rate, the rest of the seat is not silly at all, and it's very comfortable. It has a built-in massage functionality that just keeps going and going and going. So for longer distance road trips, it will help improve circulation in your legs, and of course it's gonna make your back feel better because it's just gonna not time out after about 20 minutes like most of the European options do. We get a three position memory over there for the driver's seat, power tilt telescopic steering column, but interestingly, no memory settings for the front passenger seat, even though the rest of the seat design is exactly the same. As we see in other plug-in hybrids, the rear seat dimensions change a little bit versus the non-hybrid model. We get a little bit less headroom because the seat bottom cushion is a little higher off the ground, but legroom is pretty much the same. Now, a word on legroom. Ford and Lincoln tend to measure legroom a little bit differently than some car companies, so even though I have a generous maybe four inches or so with this front seat comfortably adjusted for me at six feet tall, you will find a little bit more room in the Acura RDX, and depending on the front seat position, perhaps the Volvo XC60, but things are pretty close with those roomier options in the segment, and you'll find a roomier back passenger compartment in here, I think, than the Mercedes-Benz GLC in the real world. The rear seats offer a reasonable amount of recline. You can get them in a pretty comfortable position or a fairly upright position, and headroom is still acceptable for me at six feet tall. I have about three quarters of an inch of headroom left with this panoramic moonroof. If I move over to the middle seat position, I still have some headroom, especially if the glass is open, or I should say the shade is open, because the glass is now right above my head. So now I have about three inches of headroom. This is one of the few vehicles that is two row with a panoramic moonroof, where that moonroof goes past the rear passenger's heads and actually tends to improve the feeling of roominess and openness. Moving over to the right side, you'll notice this front seat is all the way back in its tracks. I certainly have a little bit less room in this position than you'd find in the Volvo XC60, but the difference is not enormous. I have maybe about one finger width room back here. It would be a little bit trickier to put taller folks up front and a rear-facing child seat in here, but you could probably do it in the middle. Now, one word about this front seat back. It does look a little bit peculiar with this dark section right here. This is a soft touch injection molded plastic, but then we have some hard plastics around it. I'll show you why in just a moment. 
Between the front seats, we find a center console with controls for the outboard heated seat positions, air vents, four USB charge ports. That's kind of surprising. They're all USB-C down there, but these plastics are perhaps a little bit less premium looking and less premium feeling than you'd find in some of the European options. In addition to an ever so slightly smaller back seat, we get an ever so slightly smaller cargo area. 26.9 cubic feet back here versus 27.6 for the regular Corsair. But that is still pretty generous in this segment. A QX50 is gonna have one of the larger cargo areas. It's 31 cubic feet in that model. RDX 29 cubic feet. The Lexus NX, even in its roomiest version, is actually smaller than the Corsair. And most of the European options are gonna be around 22 to 25 cubic feet because of their rear wheel drive design. That means that the Corsair is quite simply more cargo practical even in the plug-in hybrid version. Now it is worth noting that if you get the Volvo XC60 plug-in hybrid, then things don't change at all back here because the battery is not located in the rear of the vehicle, it's located in the center tunnel. And Lincoln puts the battery sort of behind the rear seats back there under the rear seat area and under the cargo area as well. Then under the floor, we have a temporary spare tire. This is one of the relatively few plug-in hybrid systems that actually has all-wheel drive and has a spare tire. This is certainly one of the reasons you might want to choose the Corsair over certain EVs if you really value that spare. You can see that there's a little bit of additional storage space around it, and then Lincoln locates the 12 volt battery just under there. What else is under the spare tire? I'm glad you asked because I was curious too. We have the high voltage cables for the high voltage battery pack, high voltage disconnect right over there. And you can see that the majority of the battery is under the rear seat area, but some of it does intrude right back here to the cargo area. And that's why this is just a tiny bit smaller than the gas version. When it comes to our exclusive trunk comfort index, I give the Corsair nine out of 10 points for a plug-in hybrid system. I really appreciate the fact that you can close the hatch with the remote control or the button on the inside or the button on the outside. Lincoln has spent a great deal of time talking about their new musical chimes as you start up the vehicle. So let's take a quick listen. And then we get a bit more violin when you turn the car off. The musical score isn't just for turning the car on and off though. It's also used for warning sounds, like putting the car in drive, while the driver's door is still open. Not only gives you this little warning in the instrument cluster, it gives you this unique tune as well. Logically, the interior of the Corsair looks an awful lot like the Lincoln Aviator, although on a smaller and less expensive scale. Up here on the ceiling, we find the controls for the large panoramic sunroof, also a sunglass holder and sliding sun visors. As I mentioned before, the panoramic sunroof is one of the larger in this segment. It goes to just past the rear passenger's heads. So it really does give this a sense of openness and airiness that we don't find in some of the competition. On the other hand, we don't find rear sun visors like you do find in some of the competitors. And not all of the rear plastics back here feel quite as premium. So on the rear doors, for instance, we have a soft touch injection molded upper section, hard plastic insert right here in the middle, and then a very soft stitched armrest with harder plastics down there at the bottom of the door. Here's another look at that front seat back setup right there. You can see this is a soft touch injection molded plastic, very similar to what we often find on dashboards. We then have that hard plastic strip and then the four way ratchet style headrest. The reason this seat back is shaped this way is part of the 24 way design and the movable cushions and the way that the shoulder section right here extends. Here's a closer look at the seat back of the driver and front passenger seats. This plastic portion is a soft touch injection molded material, similar to what we find on a lot of dashboards. We then have a hard plastic ridge right here, then the cushioning for the seat itself. The headrest is a ratchet style four-way headrest. So you ratchet right like that, and then it goes up and down. We also have height adjustable shoulder belts for the driver and front passenger. You'll notice that it really gives the seats more of a pillow top effect than you'll find in some of Lincoln's seats and some of their other models. It's a very distinctive look, although you should know that this shoulder section does not change the curvature of the seat. So it doesn't move forward and backward like you find in some seats that have this multi-part uh, setup there as far as the design goes, but it is highly adjustable. And that's why a lot of the adjustment is done in the infotainment screen. So for instance, you can adjust the air bladders that make up the lumbar support uh, individually. So the three different airbags there, you can also inflate and deflate the side bolsters and the seat bottom cushion bolsters 
all of that is done in the infotainment system. The rest of the seat settings, those are done over here on the front door itself using controls that look very much like modern Mercedes controls. The materials on the front doors, those are a little bit more premium than the rear doors, even though the style is very similar. So soft touch materials on the entire upper section of the door, and then that soft touch midsection there. You do still, however, find hard plastics down there around the bottom of the door, for instance, around that speaker grill and the bottle storage area. The door is definitely an attractive design, although in this interior with the darker leather, it does look a little bit more modern chromatic than I would like. Here's another look at the seats. You can see those inflatable bolsters and the saw bottom bolsters and then the dual extending thigh cushion setup there, which again, I think is a little bit silly. Not silly though is the dashboard design, which I think looks very attractive and definitely more interesting to my eye than what we find in the Lexus NX. Lots of different materials combined here, but I think Lincoln did a really good job, especially with some of the accent lighting and the trim here. We find aluminum trim with a really interesting texture there soft touch upper section of the dashboard, and then a stitched midsection. This kind of looks like an Audi 5000 air vent, but it's just styling. This is not actually an air vent right here in the middle. The air vents are just on either side of that. We then have a decently sized glove compartment. I was not able to fit an 11 inch tablet computer inside. However, it was just a little bit too small from that. Going back out to the rest of the dashboard, we have the large touchscreen infotainment system right here in the middle of everything. As you can see, it supports CarPlay and Android Auto integration full screen, which is a nice touch. And then it reserves the upper portion of the screen and the lower portion of the screen for various system functions. If you would rather have a shrunken CarPlay view with some of the static information sections over there on that side from the native Lincoln infotainment system, you can do that as well. Cadillac appears to be running away from CarPlay, so that's another reason that you might want to choose this Lincoln over some of the competition. Down here we have again two large air vents there. We then find the piano key shifters. These are a little bit uh, less intuitive than I would like actually than I thought to use. Uh, drive, reverse, neutral, park of course, and then the engine start stop button. You will get used to it over time. One thing that you might not get used to however is the shiny black plastic section here. It is already kind of scratched and this vehicle only has about 3,600 miles on it. So that is a long-term durability concern as far as the interior goes. Power volume knob, some additional touch and physical buttons there for various systems. This is basically a touch button and then the entire bank depresses down so that way the vehicle knows what option you've selected. So 360 degree camera, hazard lights, things like that. We then have a little Lincoln logo there and it's a little bit difficult to see, but there's also gonna be a Lincoln logo projected on this section here when the headlights are on. You can just barely see it right there. That's a nice subtle touch. Lots of ambient lighting around. This roller section here uncovers wireless charging mat, smartphone integration ports there, USB-C and USB-A. We then have two decently sized cup holders right here in the middle of everything. This is the drive mode knob, electric parking brake, tiny little storage area. The center armrest is leather wrapped and it opens to reveal a reasonably sized storage compartment with a 12 volt power outlet inside. Heads up displays are notoriously difficult to film, but we do have a very large full color one integrated into the dashboard. And it does give us the status of the Lincoln Active Glide system, now renamed Blue Cruise. So yes, Ford Blue Cruise and Lincoln Blue Cruise, they're the exact same hands off the wheel driving system. That is yet another reason that you might want to choose this over the competition. This is really going to be the only entry in the segment to offer that functionality. It seems very difficult to find actually on the ground in a lot of Cadillac models where theoretically it is offered. We have the typical Lincoln steering wheel down here. Round, of course, voice command button on the rim itself. I think that's a little bit of an unusual place to put it. We then have some infotainment buttons over here. Voice command, track forward, backward. You engage the cruise control with this button, then these buttons down here light up and the actual controls are on the back of the steering wheel. So you pull forward for resume, etc. On the right side of the steering wheel, we have a similar joystick and button bank. These give us direct access to a menu for navigation, for phone, for media, for settings. And then this one toggles through the various options available in that LCD instrument cluster. It also acts as a home button if you're inside one of these menus. The instrument cluster menus allow you to interact with certain features without having to use the touchscreen infotainment system, although for complete functionality, you'll have to use that large touchscreen in the middle of the dashboard. Under the settings option, we do get something rather unusual for a plug-in hybrid system. It's an option to allow neutral towing, which could be handy for the RV set. 
As far as the full LCD cluster goes, it is a relatively basic design as we find in other Lincolns. It's a full LCD cluster, but Lincoln has gone for a very clean and modern look rather than having a lot of information displayed. You can adjust things a little bit, but it's always going to look relatively basic, especially compared to a decent number of Fords with full LCD clusters. Before we get this out on the road, let's talk wheels and tires. This is the standard setup for the plug-in hybrid system, 20-inch alloy wrapped in 245-45R20 tires. The curb weight of the Corsair surprised me a bit. I'd expected it to be 46, 4,700 pounds. This one came in at 4,397 pounds. That's likely because the battery pack is a little bit smaller than some of the competitive plug-in hybrid systems. That trades range for theoretically better handling and better performance scores. So let's find out if that's actually the case. If you're after the Corsair with the quickest 0-60 to 60 time, that's going to be the 2.0-liter turbo model. It will do it in 6 to 6.1 seconds depending on the options you select. This plug-in hybrid system, it is a little bit more powerful, but remember this weighs more, and the way that it delivers power is not exactly the same, so your 0-60 to 60 time is probably going to end up right around 7 seconds. In our testing, it was exactly 7 seconds even. That's pretty respectable. It is obviously not as quick, of course, as the NX plug-in hybrid or the Volvo XC60 plug-in hybrid. The XC60 is particularly swift. It gives you 455 horsepower. But the mission of this plug-in hybrid system is a little bit different. This is certainly more focused on efficiency. Also, on a quiet, comfortable ride versus some of the competition. In my 6-0 stopping distance test, this also performed quite well, 115 feet. That's a little bit shorter than I'd expected, mainly because the curb weight of this, as I said before, ended up being a little bit lower than I had really expected. And that definitely helps out the handling ability of the Lincoln. Even though the suspension is tuned towards the softer side of things, this still handles pretty well. It has a solid front heavy feel out on the road, don't get me wrong, it's not going to be as engaging as a BMW X3 or a Mercedes-Benz GLC or even that Volvo XC60, but it still has a great feel out here. Now I'll apologize in advance if the exterior camera ends up getting fogged over or covered in mist. Uh, this is a misty late August day over here in coastal northern California. The temperature outside is 50 degrees, so uh, it is not exactly a hot day. And that's probably a good time for me to talk about the heating system. This does not have a heat pump like you will find in some plug-in hybrids, especially a number of luxury plug-in hybrids. That's part of why the Lincoln plug-in hybrid is about $5,000 to $5,500 less than the Lexus, definitely less expensive than the top-end versions of the Volvo XC60 plug-in hybrid. The counterpoint to that is that heating the cabin in the winter is going to consume an awful lot more electricity than cooling the cabin in the summer. Lincoln doesn't give us quite as much control over the plug-in hybrid system as some car companies do, as far as which energy source is being used when. There are drive modes though, so I'm in the conserve mode now, which is going to focus on electric-only operation. There's normal drive mode, where it's going to balance things out for the greatest efficiency at particular points in time. There's a battery save mode, where it's going to save the charge for later. And then there's a sporty driving mode, where it's going to focus on giving you 266 horsepower. One of the things you can't control with this plug-in hybrid system is throttle liftoff regeneration. It has a blended braking system, so when you put your foot on the brake pedal, it's going to engage more regenerative braking until it needs to engage the friction braking. But if you're coasting down the hill, there's no B mode. We just have drive. There are no paddle shifters on the back to engage regenerative braking mode. These paddles instead try and imitate fixed gear ratios with this hybrid drivetrain. That is somewhat similar to what we see in some Lexus models. Now, on the other hand, Ford does an excellent job with their predictive regenerative braking. So if you're going downhill, it knows that, and it's actually going to ramp that regeneration up to keep you at a very constant speed going downhill. I am a little bit torn because I really like the extra control, but I have to admit this system's automatic nature is much better at keeping the vehicle at a constant speed going downhill than I am with the paddles that go on in other vehicles. But I still kind of wish it had the paddles to adjust that regenerative braking. Now, in hybrid mode, you get paddles for a sportier feel. It's going to give you a fixed ratio and sort of a shifty kind of feel out of the system. But honestly, it's more efficient to just let the vehicle do its thing. The different priorities for the Corsair are really obvious when you get this out on a rougher gravel road like the one that I'm on here. This has a really comfortable ride, even though we have those 45 series tires that I mentioned earlier. Now, Lincoln decided to tune the Corsair a little bit differently than the MKC that this replaces, even though functionally they're very much the same sort of vehicle. The MKC was even softer tuned, even in the 2.3 liter turbo options. This is still pretty soft, but Lincoln has firmed things up just a hair. 
Over larger bumps like that though, this is still really comfortable. And that makes a lot of sense because if you're a shopper looking for something more comfortable for long highway journeys or you just want a comfortable option for your daily commute, the Corsair is going to be a much more sensible option than a lot of the competition, including entries like the Lexus NX. And that's one of the reasons that I find the NX so conflicted in a way. It has 300 horsepower out of its plug-in hybrid system that is ostensibly theoretically sporty but most of that power is on the front axle, so it just doesn't have the driving dynamics of even a Volvo XC60 T8, their plug-in hybrid system. That has a lot more engagement out on the road. But the Lexus is also not as comfortable as the Lincoln, and that's been a core Lexus value for quite some time, is a nice, soft, comfortable, quiet ride. And the NX, they're chasing something a bit sportier in this generation. It just doesn't quite work with the format of the vehicle, at least in my opinion. The Corsair, however, still has those classic values of a soft, comfortable ride with solid handling ability, quiet cabin, etc. As far as cabin noise goes, at 50 miles an hour, I measured 70 decibels, making this on the quieter side for this segment. The Screaming Angels thing, that is a little bit loud. If you're at lower speeds, you're really going to hear that pedestrian warning system on the outside. It's kind of disconcerting. And as you accelerate, you think maybe the cabin's going to be loud because you can hear that screaming angel thing so well, but honestly, it's pretty quiet. Not everybody, though, is going to be a fan of the way that a hybrid system like this accelerates. So if I come to more or less a complete stop here and then I floor it, like we find in Toyota and Lexus hybrids, it's just going to hang out at a high RPM as it accelerates. And that's because that's the most efficient operation. I don't mind that. I know some folks do. I would say it's something that you're going to get used to. You should just try and live with it for a while. See if it's really a problem for you. There's no functional problem at all. It's simply trying to be the most efficient. And that is what a plug-in hybrid system like this is all about. Now, speaking of efficiency, after a week of mixed driving in this vehicle, half of the time spent charging it on either end of my daily commute and half of the time not charging it at all, just driving it like a hybrid, I have to say I am very impressed with the range capabilities and the fuel efficiency here. I averaged 34 and a half miles per gallon driving this just like a regular hybrid that's a little bit above the EPA score, likely because of the bigger battery pack. It's able to regenerate power back into the battery going downhill. It performed very well. In my daily driving, I can make it completely to the office on electricity. Returning home, the engine turns on right around mile 24 or so. That's pretty impressive, especially when you look at the gasoline consumption numbers afterwards, where even though this spends more time in hybrid mode than the Outlander plug-in hybrid does because of its longer EV range, this ultimately ends up using less electricity and less gasoline. This is the kind of luxury crossover that is incredibly easy to live with. It's quiet, it's comfortable, I'm getting a seat massage right now as I drive along, it's also efficient, and yes, it is reliable as well. According to Consumer Reports, the Corsair has actually been rivaling a lot of Lexus models when it comes to reliability. Now, I don't know what 2023 is going to bring to that reliability mix, but they're still predicting relatively solid reliability numbers. Even if you never plug this in, you're going to be getting great fuel economy on regular unleaded. And of course, if you can plug it in, you can shift a lot of your consumption over to electricity, which is going to save you cash. It's also going to get a tax credit, which we'll talk about in just a bit. And you're not going to have to visit a gas station as often, which is something that I know a lot of people really love. The regular Corsair on my daily commute would need to visit the gas station once or twice a week. This would need to visit a gas station every two to three months on my daily commute because it spends so little time with the engine running as long as I can plug it in. And of course, I can plug it in on a regular 110, which is not going to stress my off-grid setup. And if a day is foggy like it is today, it's cloudy and foggy out there, I don't have to plug it in at all. Or if you forget to plug it in, no problem, you're still getting 33 miles per gallon combined. Lincoln definitely decided to keep the Corsair's pricing aggressive. For 2024, it starts at $40,125. That is still one of the lower starting prices in this segment, especially when you consider the fact that the 2-liter turbo engine is standard and you don't find a turbo engine standard in the Lexus NX. Instead of giving us dedicated trim levels with specific content in each trim, Lincoln gives us three different trim levels and really an awful lot of bleed over from one to the other. The pricing difference on the top end touring trim, for instance, from the base touring trim is about $10,000 worth of options that you add on to it. 
And those approximately $10,000 of options are also, generally speaking, available on the base premier trim, which is how we get all the way up to 56,905 in that base trim, actually a bit more than the base version of the plug-in hybrid system. So if you're confused, don't worry. It is confusing. Just head over to the Lincoln site and you'll have to check all the option boxes for the doodads that you want. There is quite a lot of variation available in the Corsair, just as you'd expect in a luxury vehicle, but actually it's a little bit easier to navigate around those options than the Lexus NX, which now has three different drivetrain options. But before we get to the Lexus NX, let's talk about the pros and cons. The first thing here is a matter of personal opinion, but I like the fact that the Corsair marches to a different drummer. There are so many options in this segment that are trying to be the same sort of thing. The X5, the GLC, the Alfa Romeo Stelvio, etc. They're all going after a very similar mission when it comes to the driving dynamics, the suspension feel, etc. And even though there are some front-wheel drive options in this segment available as well, like the Corsair, they are generally tuned more towards the sporty side of things, including the Lexus NX and the Acura RDX. And I like the fact that the Lincoln went in a different direction. Also, I love the plug-in hybrid system. This is the least expensive plug-in hybrid in this tiny little segment here, and it is very efficient whether you ever plug it in or not. Logically, if you can't plug it in and you never plan to, then a regular hybrid from Lexus would be a better option, but this is still a reasonable way to go. The thing that I kept coming back to with the Corsair is that it's easy to live with. It's comfortable, it's quiet, it's fuel efficient. If you can't plug it in, obviously it's not going to give you the most benefit, but it's still going to be more fuel efficient than the base turbocharged model. If you don't ever plan to plug in, you might be better served with a regular hybrid Lexus NX, but the Corsair is still very, very easy to live with. Now on the downside, there is an awful lot of gloss plastic going on on the inside. And as you can see in this model, it was already scratched up with relatively few miles on the odometer. Also, you will find a roomier interior in some of the competition. And some of that competition we're going to talk about is going to be significantly more powerful. When I was pulling up the data for this chart, two things surprised me. First, there are a reasonable number of plug-in hybrids available in this relatively small segment, and they're selling pretty well. The second thing that surprised me, the Volvo is the fourth best-selling entry in this segment. It goes Lexus NX, Audi Q5, BMW X3, which is not on this chart because I don't think it's really a Corsair competitor, and then Volvo XC60. It's actually beating the Acura RDX at the sales race. At any rate, let's dive into the details here. You'll notice that the Corsair and the Lexus NX start very close to one another, but the NX starts with a just over 200 horsepower naturally aspirated four-cylinder engine. It's the same engine and transmission you find in a base Toyota RAV4. I think that's a bit of a misstep for Lexus. I really wish the turbo engine had been standard. Now, on the bright side for the NX, we do have the optional hybrid system, which is really the way to go. You get good fuel economy, reasonable performance as well. Not going to be quite as good as some of the hybrid options, but it's going to be a lot less expensive than the plug-in hybrid. Now, the NX plug-in hybrid does get less expensive in the top end versus the Corsair, but the Corsair has more features in that top-end model, like the hands-free driving ability. If you want to know more about that, we have a separate video on Blue Cruise 1.2, also known as Lincoln Active Glide. As far as just entry-level pricing for the plug-in hybrid system, the Corsair is definitely less expensive, significantly less. But you get less power and you get less range. Also, if you get the optional charger in the NX, it will charge a little bit faster. The Audi Q5 also has an available plug-in hybrid system. That one is also going to be a bit more expensive, but I really like the way Audi has done their all-wheel drive system combined with that plug-in hybrid. It uses a dual-clutch transmission for a very normative plug-in hybrid feel. If you're interested in something that feels very consistent, very regular, then you might want to take a look at that Q5 plug-in hybrid. It also has a pretty decent amount of cargo space in the back. On the downside, it gets pretty darn expensive. It goes up to nearly $72,500. But hold on to your hats, because if you think that's pricey, the fourth best seller in this segment is the Volvo XC60, and with its popularity has risen its price tag. It goes up to $79,245 if you get the Polestar engineered version. Now, admittedly, that model will go 0 to 60 in just over four seconds. It is very, very fast, 455 horsepower, a very unique plug-in hybrid system that is plug-in, hybridized, turbocharged, and supercharged. 
it is really a lot of things going on there. Volvo's plug-in hybrid system is perhaps a little bit more complicated than some, but it is a whole lot of fun to drive. And it doesn't occupy any space in the cargo area because Volvo sticks the battery right in the middle of everything. And even though it does use an e-all-wheel drive system that, like the Lexus NX does, as far as all-wheel drive performance goes, it actually is pretty much on par with the mechanical all-wheel drive options in this segment. The XC60 is really pretty. It's also really comfortable, so that's probably why it's selling very well. The 2024 RDX is definitely on the less expensive side of things, 42945 It also has one of the best automatic transmissions here. That 10-speed is really fantastic. It also doesn't go nearly as high as the competition. Although, remember, no hybrid, no plug-in hybrid, and no performance version of the RDX exists. And there is at least one of those available in the competition. But it will set you back less than the top-end versions of the rest of these, right around $55,000 or so. Bottom line, the Corsair is probably the pragmatic luxury entry here. If I were shopping between these options, I would probably lean towards the Corsair because of its pricing. I think the fuel economy and the pricing are just a fantastic combo. Clearly, if you want better fuel economy, there's the Lexus NX, likely better reliability as well. But the Delta is not going to be enormous. If you want the most fun of this group, it would be the Volvo XC60. And you can get a plug-in hybrid Volvo XC60 an awful lot less than that $79,000 price point. The XC60 plug-in hybrid starts around 47000 what is it, 47745 So definitely within the pricing range of the Corsair plug-in hybrid, but if you want all of the bells and whistles, if you want the performance brakes, if you want everything there in your XC60, then it's going to be pretty darn pricey. On the other hand, you're getting 36 miles of electric range. It's second only to the Lexus NX plug-in hybrid and 28 miles per gallon, which is still pretty darn impressive considering 455 horsepower. If I had a money was no object pick, that would be the XC60. It is definitely the way I would go if I had the cash. The other thing about the XC60 plug-in hybrid is that it's pretty darn efficient. We get the second best EV range in this segment, 36 miles, and you'll get 28 miles per gallon combined afterwards. 28 isn't 33 like we find in the Corsair or nearly 40 like we find in the Lexus NX. But remember, 455 horsepower and you're still getting 28 miles per gallon and you're still getting nearly 40 miles of electric range. That combo is very, very impressive. So if money is no object, definitely get the XC60. I would say it's the best of this group. But in a rational world, I probably would just spend the money on the Corsair, get the Blue Cruise hands-free driving system, and probably try and forget about those really quick 0 to 60 times. Let me know what you would get down there in the comments section below. And uh, be sure and hit that subscribe button if you haven't done so. Find us at Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Threads, X, all those places. And I'll see all of you later.